Now, let's hear from Dr. Lucy Olivova. The title is Western Policies and Suture Prints. Dr. Olivova, the stage is yours. Thank you. I would first like to thank all those who made my participation at this conference possible. I am very honored to be here. Woodblock prints with auspicious imagery were mass produced during the Qing Dynasty. One of the main centers of the printing industry was the city of Suzhou, which had the advantage of a long artistic tradition. Suzhou prints circulated throughout China. They were also transmitted to neighboring countries and exported as far as Europe, apparently as part of the merchandise brought over by the East India companies, although in negligible quantities when compared to tea, silk, or porcelain. Given the fact that pictures and prints had not been recorded in the accounts of these companies, historians assume that they were most probably brought to Europe in the private consignments of marine officers. My presentation explores the presence of Chinese prints in various palaces in Central Europe. The region lies inland and does not have direct access to the sea. It is not fully understood how Chinese prints and other objects traveled from ports to their new homes because of the paucity of written evidence. It is assumed that acquisitions were made through go-betweens and private agents who finally brought them to their owners. Within a short lapse of time, they were mounted in representative rooms, sustaining the ostentatiousness of the owner's status. I'll introduce interiors preserved in Bohemia, Bavaria, Austria, and Saxony all of them places which I visited and inspected in person. They were selected in order to illustrate the typical ways of how the prints were kept and displayed in the mid 18th century with regard to the art historical context of the region. Prints often mistaken for paintings were mainly used as wall decorations, either as wallpapers or integrated into wooden wall paneling or applied onto screens. They were also, though seldom, exhibited in the manner of a picture gallery. In passing, it needs to be mentioned that Chinese single sheet prints were not only used to decorate interiors, but were sometimes kept in special collections of rare books and graphic art. For example, the set made up of 26 prints depicting beautiful women acquired in 1756 by the Landgraf of Hessen Castle. The set has always been kept as a collector's item, carefully handled, each print back on fine linen, and all of them bound in a large volume. This explains their excellent condition and the extraordinary brightness of the colors purple, green, red yellow, etc. There are 19 different images, some of them duplicated. As we shall notice in the following examples, it is quite common for identical images to occur twice or three times within one collection. Furthermore, identical prints reappear in other collections and places. For example, some prints from Hessen Castle have their counterparts in other German collections at Braunschweig, Dresden, Nymphenburg, etc. And some matching prints are among the collection recently discovered in Czechia. The prints were originally hung on walls as self-contained works of art. The arrangement was that of a picture gallery and has been captured in this historical watercolor. It shows the Chinese room, which had been thus furnished after the year 1746 at Castle Schlebe. The prints of Suzhou beauties are densely placed on the walls 
each one in a carved gilded frame. There are more East Asian items in this room. Porcelain plates above the doors, vases placed on shelves attached to the walls, a Chinese lantern and a mirror, all being the habitual embellishment of a Chinese room of the period. The furnishing was taken down in 1898 and the room has been totally refurbished. Paneled with pine wood, only the parquetage on the floor remains. The prints were stored away and forgotten, and when rediscovered, the frame was gone and their condition was alarming. There are altogether 32 images, which come from three or four similar yet separate series. One series shows two female figures leaning on and connected by a piece of elaborate furniture. The background is empty. This is the same series represented in the German collections mentioned above. Another series from Schlebe shows a beauty with a little boy dressed in red. The figures are situated in a simply rendered interior with a moon window looking out onto a garden. Some prints just shown do not appear in other collections and are probably unique. The prints which are duplicated, on the other hand, uh, offer interesting comparisons. The coloring differs from print to print. They were, after all, intended for individual sale. Next, their current condition varies greatly. It was caused not only by careless handling, but also through adjustments made at the time of their installation. For example, the original size had often been adjusted. The print from Schlebe on the left has rounded corners and has been cut narrower on both sides, whereas the print from Brunswick on the right had been cut short at the top. Multiple occurrences of identical prints in various collections are direct evidence of the distribution of Chinese prints across Europe at the time. There is, however, additional indirect evidence provided by etchings made in Europe. The pseudo print on the right inspired French artists who remodeled it as a copper plate etching seen in the middle. They added the background and the sense of space and replaced unfamiliar details with familiar ones, like a little phone with a set of bells, creating a chinoiserie. The etching then served as a model for wall paintings, enlarged and colored, like the detail from the Chinese pavilion at Drottningholm, Sweden, on the left. Analogical examples are plentiful. Some of the prints discussed also appear in the Badenburg summer house, built on the grounds of the Nymphenburg Park in Bavaria. The original installation of the prints dates from the years 1758 to 1763. However, they were later covered beneath a full length wallpaper from Canton, Guangzhou, and only discovered during restoration work in 1980 when they were consequently conservated and displayed in a small neighboring room, the former dressing room. Visitors can see 35 prints, many in multiple copies. There are only 14 different images. The prints were arranged side by side according to their original display as a collage in a regular pattern without any obvious consideration regarding the subject matter. Back in the 18th century, adjustments had been made. For example, the scene with Wu Sung in the lower right corner, also in the Umin Mori collection, reappears in the upper left corner, this time cut into two pieces, placed one above the other in order to fit the remaining empty strip on the wall. 
another visible adjustment was the addition of trees and flowers, butterflies and birds into the boundaries between individual prints. They were painted in a Chinese style by a local European painter in order to embellish the empty parts and to achieve the final effect of a continuous wallpaper. In the representative rooms of palaces, it was, however, more common to have walls decorated with wooden panels. Panels were colored, their borders carved, and in some cases gilded, as exemplified by the Chinese room in Lichtenwalde Palace in Saxony. According to conservators, the furnishing was made after 1730, but prior to 1750. Catching the eye are 34 pictures integrated into the green paneling. They show beauties in elegant attire and are related to, but not identical with, the prints discussed above. Actually, only 16 images are hand-colored Suzhou prints. 18 of them are paintings. Apart from green, light blue was the other favorite color applied on paneling at the time. In the so-called small Chinese salon, at the Esterhazy Palace in Austria, light blue paneling creates the setting for 18 prints, the original size of which was respected. The arrangement accentuates straight lines, whereas the so-called grotesque ornament painted on the paneling provides the curves typical of Rococo. There are six repeated images. When linked together, Four of them would form the cycle of four seasons, and the remaining two are part of an incomplete tetraptic, depicting the four treasures of Avengers. Each print features two female figures and little boys in lavish interior. Colors applied on the figures are bright, whereas those applied on the ample architectural setting are subdued. The background artfully uses linear perspective adapted from Western sources and distinguishes these prints from those presented so far. The name of Guan Zhui Yu or his studio, Sintel Hao, are inscribed on depicted calligraphic scrolls. Presumably, Guan Zhui Yu was familiar with Western engravings distributed by the nearby Catholic mission in Suzhou and adapted the single point perspective and chiaroscuro effects in his works. This room was furnished approximately in 1750 under Prince Paul II Esterhazy, whose wife had been a lady in waiting of the Duchess of Lorraine. As documented, the couple brought along artists from Lorraine to decorate the interior of Esterhazy Palace. It is therefore possible that these Suzhou prints had been acquired in France. After all, the same set applied to a folding screen is also preserved in Chateau de Filière in France. Social connections and marriages played an important role in search of the fashionable, as is evident from diverse examples of the dissemination of styles in palaces across Europe, including the taste for Chinese objects. There is more evidence of the so-called Chinese fashion in the Esterhazy Palace. For example, this folding screen. It is pasted on both sides with Chinese pictures of beauties, arranged like a chessboard. Twelve pictures were used, but only two repeating images. One below with a Han lady reading a book, the other with a Manchu lady holding a puppy. Manchus occasionally feature among the pictures of beauties, recognizable by three earrings in one ear and a typical headdress, like in the detail on the right, or as in the print preserved in Badenburg, Oslebi, and Hessen Castle, by feet of natural size, a white silk ribbon on her breast, a tobacco pie, or other clothing accessories. Back to the topic of wall paneling. With the advance of neoclassicism, 
and increasing interest in nature, the taste for bright artificial colors gave way to natural appearances. Consequently, wooden panels on walls no longer had a colored coat, and wallpapers featuring landscape panoramas came into vogue. This tendency is apparent in the former Leitam room in Graz, Austria. At some point during the, 16, the 1760s, the owner had it refurbished as a Chinese room with prints in thin gilded frames integrated into panels of fine hazelnut wood. Notwithstanding that the original owner was an ordinary country aristocrat and held no special position at court, he nevertheless had the room decorated in Chinese style. It implies that in the second half of the 18th century, the taste for chinoiserie gradually spread downwards from high aristocratic circles, and Asian objects became obtainable for upper middle classes. The Leikham House was bought in 1806 by a successful publisher without a pedigree called Andreas Leikham, hence the name adopted for the house and the Chinese room. Producing wooden paneling with decorations was costly and time consuming, but there was always the alternative of creating an illusory one, one that was painted. Such a solution had been implemented in 1754 by the unknown designer of the small cabinet at Veltrusi. He used a range of prints and applied them onto textile hangings. The painting on the textile base is imitating wood grain, and so are the illusory frames, which cast painted shadows and give three-dimensional impression. Prints were trimmed to fit the car carving shapes of the frames and then glued onto the textile hanging. At the end, everything was covered with a layer of varnish. The effect of gaufrage on the flower baskets has thus been lost. Interestingly, the poems inscribed on the prints were either cut off or erased as still visible on the upper left. There are altogether 51 hand-colored Sujo prints featuring four different motifs. Beauties, bulk of flowers in a pot, birds and flowers, and small flower baskets. Identical prints are known from other European collections too. The designer at Veltrusi faced the challenge of how to cover the whole wall surface with relatively small pictures. In solution, much of the space was occupied by cleverly applied intertwined frames. In the center, two prints with the same motif were paired and the border between them skillfully blurred thus achieving the impression of one large image instead of two smaller ones. These two fragments of wall decoration are now on display in the Museum of Furniture in Vienna. They are paintings on paper, likewise attached onto textile and surrounded by blue frames, which are illusory. The height of the frame is three meters, but the picture itself measured only one meter. Consequently, the designer optically increased its size by placing additional paper at the top and at the bottom and applying similar colors. The additional parts are easily discernible. The playful and sophisticated style was typical of Theresian Rococo, a variant Rococo style named after Maria Theresa, who ruled from 1740 to 1780. A notable example of, of such design is the Million and Zimmer in the Imperial Stammer Palace at Schönbrunn near Vienna. It was furnished in 1766. In this case, the paper applications are paintings of Indian provenience and the background is made of treated wood, carved and gilded. This was a far more expensive way of furnishing in comparison with Veltrusi. The last interior 
to be discussed is now dismantled due to the undergoing restoration works, which may take a further two or three years. This was a private resting room for the owner of Veltrusi, the walls of which were mounted with textile hangings and a light paper print, very much as in the above mentioned small cabinet, but using a different set of images and a modified decorative scheme. In historical records, the room is referred to as Zimmer mit Spalieren, the room with wall hanging and much later in the 1970s was somewhat misleadingly nicknamed the Count's study. Hand-colored prints displayed on the walls fall into a very distinct genre. On the original single sheet, there are two superimposed deep shelves separated by a pair of drawers, closed or slightly open. Placed on shelves are valuable objects, books and fruits rendered as a visual illusion, intending to trick the eye into perceiving the image as a three-dimensional reality. An almanac shown on a particular print is dated to the 16th year of the Qianlong reign, that is 1751. Illusionistic still lives on shelves were most likely derived from Western etchings available in China and had a certain impact on Chinese painting. The genre also became quite popular in Korea. In regards to Europe, analogous prints as at Veltrusi are now held in Swedish museums, private collections, uh, Christa van der Broek collection, and a very similar ones decorate a bedroom at Milton Hall, England. Identical motives were also used in marketry on French furniture in the 1770s. In the room at Veltrusi, some 35 prints were used. They were arranged in panels of various sizes, pasted on the textile base and surrounded by illusory Rococo frames. In the upper section of the large panels, some prints had to be divided in two in order to meet the grouping of the panel. The original installation took place in 1754 or possibly in 1766. At the time, many details were retouched with opaque blue, green, and elsewhere red colors. The conservators decided to preserve the additional coloring, respecting its historicity. There are indications that the set does not originate from Suzhou workshops. For example, the fruits in the blue bowl do not grow in Suzhou, although they could have been imported. One is Liju, and the other is a seed pot of Sterculia. Sterculia is a subtropical tree which grows in Southeast Asia, and it actually appears depicted in Cantonese wallpapers such as this one on the left, installed at the old Amelie Square in the Netherlands. Another objection which can be raised against the prints being a Suzhou product is the inferior level of the pictorial techniques, especially when rendering the illusory depths of the shelves. It does not match the mastery achieved by Suzhou artists in their surviving works. My presentation explored the diversity of installations of Chinese prints in historical palace interiors. Most of the prints discussed were produced in Suzhou. The original size of the single sheet was approximately 110 by 55 centimeters. Among the various subject matters, a beautiful woman was the most frequent one. They were acquired during the decade around the year 1750 and presumably installed within a short period after the acquisition. The approximate date of their production was literally earlier. They were what one would call early Suzhou prints. Some interiors and prints have already been described in specialized literature given in this list. These publications and many others 
helped me to gain a deeper understanding of the subject. It goes without saying that Western historical interiors decorated with Suzhou prints could not have been too many, and only a very few of them have survived. In conclusion, when observing the so-called Chinese rooms as an enti entity, it is difficult to decide whether the resulting design is Eastern or Western. It can be interpreted as a blend of Chinese prints and Western tailoring. Thank you for your attention.